Why do doctors check reflexes? My wife has awesome reflexes, which is of course why I married her. She's got biceps, triceps, brachioradialis, knee jerk, and ankle jerk reflexes. But what is the point of this? The way reflexes work is when the doctor's hammer hits the tendon, it stretches the tendon and stretches the muscle and the stretch receptors in the muscle spindle then send information through the afferent nerve, through the dorsa root. This then enters the spinal cord and synapses on the alpha motor neuron in the front of the spinal cord and this motor neuron sends information through the ventral nerve and back to the muscle and synapses on the muscle causing it to contract initiating the reflex. It's thought that reflexes have a role in preventing overstretching of the tendons which could lead to injury or even avulsion of the tendon. These are some common locations where doctors check reflexes though many other reflexes are possible such as pectoralis deltoid or even a jaw jerk reflex. Also, because specific spinal nerves innervate specific muscles, reflexes can give information about the integrity of specific roots. For instance, the patellar or knee jerk reflex gives information about the L4 nerve root. The hamstrings reflex gives information about the L5 nerve root. And the Achilles or ankle jerk reflex gives information about the S1 nerve root. We can grade reflexes as part of the neurological exam and document it in the medical record. 2 plus is a normal response. 1 plus is a diminished reflex, zero is an absent reflex, three plus is an exaggerated or brisk reflex, and four plus is a very brisk reflex or clonus, which is sustained reflex when maintaining tension on the tendon where the reflex occurs again and again. The key point is the reflexes tell us something about the function of the nerve. And going back to this diagram, you can imagine if there's injury to anything on this pathway, it's gonna tend to diminish the reflex. For instance, if someone has diabetic neuropathy and there's damage to the peripheral nerve, you're going to get less afferent input, hence a diminished reflex. Or if you had, say, a lateral L4 herniated disc crushing this ventral nerve root, you're going to get less of a reflex. Or even the motor neuron, for instance, in poliomyelitis, could cause a diminished reflex. Any damage to this pathway will cause a one plus or absent reflex. But moving my quadriceps actually starts in my brain. It starts in the primary motor cortex on the opposite side of the brain. And those motor fibers descend through the corona radiata, through the internal capsule and the cerebral peduncles, and then cross over in the medulla to the other side in the pyramidal decussation and in the lateral cortical spinal tract and go all the way down to the lumbar spine and then they synapse on the alpha motor neuron. So what happens if the injury happens higher up in the brain or in the spinal cord? It turns out these lateral cortical spinal tract fibers regulate the alpha motor neurons and when they're injured the reflex arc is increased and the reflexes are more brisk. In other words three plus or four plus. Here are some examples of central nervous system disorders, injuries to the brain and spinal cord that lead to brisk or exaggerated reflexes you may have seen in cartoons as a child, multiple sclerosis, stroke, cervical myelopathy, or injured to the cervical spinal cord, and of course, a thousand other diseases, brain tumors, spinal cord tumors, traumatic spine injury, for example, can all cause brisk or exaggerated reflexes. So how does this work in practice? Well, I'll show you a few cases of my actual patients, though I've rounded their ages and simplified some of the details for private and to make them straightforward. Case number one, this is very recent within the last week. I was called by the ER doctor about a 20 year old man who developed tingling in the feet which spread over a few days into the hands and arms and he had a recent upper respiratory tract infection. It was suspected that he could have a condition called Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is an autoimmune disease of the peripheral nervous system of the peripheral nerves which can happen after a viral illness and it's usually ascending. It starts in the feet and then moves up. However, the ER doctor noted that his reflexes were preserved, which is very unlikely in Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a peripheral nervous system disorder, which should disrupt the reflex arc and make the reflexes diminished. So he had an MRI scan of the spine and it showed this. Here we're looking at an axial image through the cervical spine and the spine should look dark like this, but you see these white spots. 
This is a classic sign known as the inverted V sign and it's typical of a disorder called subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord where both the posterior and lateral columns are involved. It's most commonly associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. It can also be caused by other things such as copper deficiency. However, when asked for further information, this young man admitted that he used nitrous oxide as a recreational drug. This is whippets and it's a huge problem where I live in Los Angeles and unfortunately we've seen many many victims of this. Nitrous oxide, the inhalant, actually inactivates vitamin B12 and can cause B12 deficiency. Now B12 is common, you're constantly eating it, it's in meat, milk, cheese, and eggs. However, if you don't take in enough B12 or absorb enough B12 and take too much nitrous oxide, you can get the deficiency and this leads to accumulation of the neurotoxin methylmalonic acid which can damage the peripheral nerves, the spinal cord, and even the brain and is known to cause subacute combined degeneration and unfortunately I've seen many people develop this from whippets and these are sold at smoke shops and they're often marketed in colorful packages that look like they would be safe to an unsuspecting victim so please be very, very careful, nitrous oxide is dangerous. Though it's treated by stopping nitrous oxide use and injectable vitamin B12 supplementation and hopefully he'll recover well over time. Case number two is from when I was a third year medical student in 2007 and I still remember it vividly to this day. I was working with a neurosurgeon in the outpatient setting who was seeing a 55 year old man with weakness in the right leg who had multiple MRIs showing extensive herniated discs including multiple right-sided herniated discs in the lumbosacral spine and also a lower cervical spine up in the neck, right-sided herniated disc. So which disc was causing the symptoms? Which one needed to be operated on? Well, he had brisk reflexes in the right lower extremity, including clonus or a sustained reflex in the right ankle. So it wouldn't make sense for say a L5 S1 herniated disc to cause the leg weakness. It could only be explained by a central nervous system process Hence, it was actually the cervical disc and the lumbosacral disc, though large and impressive on MRI scans, were actually asymptomatic incidental findings. Hence, the surgeon recommended doing an ACDF anterior cervical discectomy infusion on the cervical herniated disc that was actually causing the symptoms. Case number three, this is a 40 year old woman with a left foot drop. Foot drop is a disorder where the foot drops down during walking and the toes can drag on the floor due to weakness of the anterior tibialis muscle, the muscle that normally lifts up the foot. Examination showed profound weakness of the left anterior tibialis muscle. However, there was preservation of strength of all other muscles in the lower extremity, including the calves. So there are many things that can cause foot drop. However, injuries to the brain and spinal cord that cause foot drop usually cause some weakness of some of the other muscles in the lower extremity. So the main causes of sort of isolated anterior tibialis weakness are L5 radiculopathy, in other words, something like a herniated disc in the low back impinging on the L5 nerve root, and that causes weakness of this muscle, or damage to the common perioneal nerve in the lateral leg, and both can cause very similar symptoms. So this woman had a totally normal left hamstrings reflex. And it turns out it's the medial or inner aspect of the hamstrings reflex that correlates with the L5 nerve root. And it's fairly unlikely to have an L5 radiculopathy. In other words, a pinched L5 nerve root and still have normal reflexes, but have profound weakness in the anterior tibialis. Now, this woman ended up having a common perineal neuropathy and not an L5 radiculopathy. In this particular particular woman's case, it was actually due to leg crossing. It turns out if someone has a habit of crossing their legs in a certain way such that they're pinching that nerve, the common paraneural nerve, particularly a lean person without a lot of fat padding the nerve, 
they can actually develop foot drop over time, though it generally recovers if you're able to break that habit and allow the nerve to recover, which did in fact happen with this woman. Now, there are more complexities to the case. If someone has an L5 radiculopathy, they can also have weakness of the hamstrings, and they may also have weakness of inversion of the foot, whereas that should be preserved with common perineal neuropathy. So really, reflexes are just one aspect of the exam in order to make this diagnosis. There are also a few other systemic diseases that can affect reflexes that aren't injuries to specific areas of the nervous system. For instance, hyperthyroidism or elevated levels of thyroid hormone can cause brisk or rapid reflexes. The same with hypocalcemia or low calcium levels. Whereas elevated magnesium can diminish reflexes. Sometimes very high doses of magnesium are used in obstetrics. And if the reflexes are gone, that can suggest that the levels of magnesium may be becoming too high. Also, hypothyroidism or low levels of thyroid hormone can cause diminished reflexes and can also delay the relaxation of the reflexes and cause the knee jerk reflex to appear hung up for a brief period of time. So if you have any questions about reflexes or the neurological exam, let me know in the notes below and comment on your own reflexes. Are they average, brisk, or diminished? And is this associated with any specific neurological disease? Let me know if you like this kind of general educational video and if you have any other suggestions for videos in the future.